I want to start off with just talking about uh, my guiding rules that I actually have a sign up on my wall in my office and it says no forced trades no big losses and I've had that sign up there for for a long time um, I also have a sign next to it that says losers average losers and basically those are the, the big three rules that I always uh, follow and I know they may sound uh, maybe obvious or uh, or simplistic but believe me there's uh, <laughs> these are the things that uh, most traders deviate from uh, the most and, and when I mean about forced trades let's talk about that for just a second um, and I'm sure everybody that's a stock trader for any period of time can relate to uh, taking trades that maybe you shouldn't have or feeling antsy and itchy to do something so you end up uh, taking a trade and later on you look back at it and you notice uh, you know why did I do that what the heck was I thinking um, that's that that pressure to to uh, you know have action in the market Dave I'm curious you know you've been doing this for a long long time and I'm sure back when you started this was probably a problem just like it, it was for me and for everybody else um, you know how do you deal with that do you ever feel the urge to you know actually you know put on trades that maybe you you feel you shouldn't or, or do, you, do you get this kind of uh, pressure on you ever yeah I mean it's it's it that's very natural I mean for anybody uh, in the markets you have these emotions weighing on you back and forth should I be buying should I be selling and the way you overcome this and the way you overcome forcing trades is you you develop a system or a method that that works in good markets and bad markets and so it really comes down to discipline do you have rules that you filter every idea through that's how you get over forcing trades because forcing trades all comes because you're emotionally in the wrong place and uh, and you're not following some kind of systematic uh, system to, to eliminate the emotion yeah and, and you know of course you have to have a system first but you know having a system and and uh, having a set of rules is the very first step and some people you know you, you may not even have that yet and you're you're looking for those rules and that that system that you could follow but then you have to have the discipline to actually follow it and uh, something that I always try to point out to new traders especially is that you have to define you know what what it is you're doing I mean if, if you're uh, you know if you're a certain type of trader you got to stay in that uh, in that area of competence and that means sacrificing you know some of the other areas um, main thing is you know I'm always looking to trade only setups that I am familiar with that I know what to expect I'm always trying to keep my losses as small as possible back into the lowest risk trades possible and I never ever add money to losing trades if I'm down on a trade uh, I'm not going to add to it that's the you know probably the ultimate amateur mistake I'm never ever adding to a losing trade and averaging down worst possible advice you could get if that's the kind of advice you're getting fire whoever's giving you that advice um, real quick let's just talk about you know professional trading goals and what that means uh, to me professional trading for me means taking minimal risk um, and and then capturing relatively large gains relative to that risk Now that word relative is really important because if you're a day trader well a, a, a five percent gain is probably going to be a pretty big gain but if you're a long-term investor that that wouldn't be of course so it's relative to your risk and then you want to maximize compounding by rolling that over as many times as you can and again if you're a shorter term trader you're going to have more uh, you're going to have more turnover. You're going to be rolling that over more often. If you're a longer term investor, it's going to be less often. So it's relative. Now, one of the things that surprises a lot of people is that when I tell them that I want to be in the market as little as possible. As a matter of fact, if we, if we circle back to when um, I won the U.S. Investing Championship, uh, that entire year, I was up 155% that year. And if you looked at the whole year and like averaged out my exposure in the market, I was only in the market about 50% of the time. So if you take, you know, 12 months, on average, six of those months, I was out of the market. So I, I, I achieved that return. And many of my, my big return years have been achieved with being out of the market. And that's because when you're in the market, you're at risk. So I'm trying to be in the market at, at specific 
uh, particular times. Um, and that leads me to the first key to big performance, and that's timing. Um, Dave, you know, a lot of people say you can't time the market. You know, I, I mean, I always say anybody who says you, know, you can't do something, it's because they can't do it, um, and they don't believe somebody else can do it because they can't see themselves doing it. But you know, you and I have been timing stocks for you know decades now. Um, you know, what do you say to that? And then uh, what any you know advice for getting over you know having that limitation in your in your thinking? Well, the, the timing is is coming down to looking at how a stock is acting, and there's certain patterns that repeat themselves over and over again, in especially in successful stocks, stocks that are in uptrends. They they act a certain way. So once you identify a, a base or how a stock breaks out or starts a move or or even in the middle of the move or when it's topping out if you can identify that by looking at charts and studying them then you can get down to the point where you're buying just as the move is starting and i've just you know i've looked at probably millions of charts now and and have studied them uh and and looked at these moves and they're defined patterns that show up over and over again. So to say that you can't time the market, um, I would just say, well, I'll show you so many charts, so many different situations where the timing, it worked and it continues to work. It's the same thing. I, the other thing, I, you can look back at charts going back into the 1930s and 20s, and even I've seen charts of even below 1900 where the same patterns repeat themselves over and over again. So timing is, is, is done by looking at charts and it continues to, to help in finding the best stocks to buy. Yeah, and charts are just showing the price. I mean, it's not. There's nothing magic about them. It's not like it's a precursor to anything. It's actually uh, the end result. So it's just showing the price. But even Warren Buffett is timing his trades. You know, maybe they're based on a different factor. Maybe he's not even looking at a chart. You know, he's looking at fundamentals. But when those fundamentals deteriorate, he's out. When when he sees the right valuation, the fundamentals, he's in. There's still a timing mechanism. You have to make a decision to buy, a decision to sell. So. So that timing factor, you know, and, and the, I think the big point that people have to realize is that you're not going to make big returns in the market. When I say big returns, I'm talking about 40% a year or greater is what I always shot for is my minimum level, and what I really wanted was a triple digit re, uh, a year. That's what I always shot for was that triple digit year. I had a, a lot of years that I was able to do that, about 75, 80 percent of my years, I, I had triple digit years for, for over a decade. Um, but then, you know, on the, the years that weren't so good, I wanted to return 35, 40 percent, and then if it was a real big bear market, I, you know, if I broke even or just had single digit losses, I was happy. Uh, but Regardless, you're still going to have to uh, have some sort of timing, and people think that you could just put a stock away and and hold it. Doesn't work that way. I mean, even if you do get onto a long-term winner and you put it away, you, when it really all comes down to it in the long in the long run, you're not going to get that consistent those consistent returns where you're you're making a career out of this and you're and and, and you're making a living off of it. That that requires some trading and some timing. I want to point out something that. Um, that I, that I call the 50-80 rule. And, and as much as I've pointed this out and I've talked about it in my books and so forth, a lot of people don't realize that the big market leaders of one cycle, when they finally top, when you get a big secular move and it tops and it was a key leader, the chances of it going down 50% are about 80%. And the chances of it going down 80% are about 50%. And the average, the average leader when it tops goes down about 70, 75%. Now that's a huge decline. If you have a portfolio of these big uh, high octane names that are doing great in a bull market, and when they finally top, you could be sitting at a huge loss, lose everything you've made and even more. Now this is an example of lumber liquidators, which was you know, a market leader coming out of the, uh, of the 2012 market and uh, had a big move. And then of course, you can see gave up everything. And this isn't uh, something that's new. This happens cycle after cycle. You know, David pointed out, you can look at charts going all the way back. Uh, you know, we've looked all the way back to the 1800s. And 
it's exactly the same. It happens the same way every time. Um, you'll see the same the same patterns develop. You'll see the same type of uh, uh, emotions taking hold of people. You know, holding on to the the, the big high flying names that have been going up for a long period of time. And then when everybody wants to own them, like back in uh, the '90s, you had uh, uh, you know you had uh, Qualcomm, JDS, Uniphase. You had uh, uh, even Amazon back then was a, was a big leader. Yahoo, EMC, and when these stocks finally topped and became um, household names, uh, many of them were down 80, 90 percent. Some of them went completely out of business, and then dead money for 16 years. Dave, we've seen this. How many cycles have you seen this? The same story. 87 top, you know, uh, the 90s. Now, you know, going into this market with the Fang stocks, so those will probably be something we'll be talking about 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, let's talk about, you know, about get rolled back a little bit on timing, okay? So for those of you who have read my book, they, you probably know about the volatility contraction pattern or that vernacular and how um, this is nothing, you know, new as far as, you know, Dave's been doing this and O'Neill's been doing this for a long, long time. I just uh, came up with a, a, a sort of an overlay, the, a way to look at, say, like a cup with handle or some of these patterns and have just a little bit better way of, of determining when one was actually uh, setting up constructively. Because I found over the years, a, a lot of people would come to me and say, hey, you know, is this a, a, a cup with handle? And it just wasn't a, a very good setup. So um, I came up with this volatility contraction uh, uh, idea, and it's really uh, helped people quite a bit. Um, and, and this is something, again, that we're not, we, we can't cover everything here today. If you want to spend a you know, few days with us and we go over this stuff with 400 pages of workbook material, you can attend the Master Trader Program, and maybe in the future we'll be able to do like a technical analysis um, uh, webinar, but we're going to touch upon some things here and stick to the bigger concepts. Uh, but I, you should, you know, definitely, of course, O'Neill's book is, is a, is a, is probably one of the greatest books ever written on the stock market. I think my books are right up there too, and I think they all work very, uh, 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 very good together. So um, you can learn a lot about that uh, by just reading those books. I think if you just read O'Neill's book and my two books, you don't really need anything else, and you'll learn a lot about this. But the timing, I want to be going into these stocks as they're coming out of these consolidations, and you'll notice how this stock is moving very quickly. See, this is where the, this is where you're maximizing that compounding. You're timing that trade at a point where it's either moving very quickly or it's moving maybe against me. And that's also, it may, you may not like having a loss, but if I'm going to have a loss, I want that loss to happen pretty quickly. I like to know because then I can move on to something else. It's sort of like, you know, would you want to be in a bad marriage for 20 years? And no, you know, I'd like to know right away that this isn't going to work, and then I could find someone else that's right for me. I mean, that's the way you have to look at a stock. You want to try to know. So by timing your trade and knowing what to expect, knowing whether you're right or wrong very quickly it saves you a lot of time, and time is yeah, money Mark, in the market. Yeah, Mark, I would also add that, that you not, now, not only have to look at the chart itself, but also look at the volume, because when a stock is contracting and it's, it's getting tighter and tighter, the volume is usually drying up. And then when the stock comes out of that, starts breaking into uh, above the base, then the volume really picks up. The demand should really pick up. If it doesn't, then you've got a problem, and it's probably going to reverse and start breaking down. Yeah, and and let, that, that's a perfect time. Let's talk about breaking down. Not all these patterns are going to work, all right? And that, and when you're, if, as long as you know your criteria is sound, then you'll have a pretty good idea that the market's not right. See, if, if your trades aren't working, there can only be one of two things wrong. Either one, your criteria is flawed, or two, the market's just not right at that time. It can only be one of those two things. If you have solid criteria and you're buying at the right point, well, then the only thing that's going to hold that back is a, is a, is a, a negative market, is a hostile market. But if, if you have poor criteria, you might be in a great market and you're not doing well. So you, you have to go back and check your criteria. If it's, if it's sound, then you have to realize there's times where you're going to get stopped out. And here, here you go here. There's a perfect example of another... And I wanted to show, during this webinar, I wanted to show some of these very high quality, quote unquote, quality companies and how, what happens to them when they top. This is going into the subprime debacle, going into 08, 09, and here's Citigroup. You know, uh, again, 
another name that has never come back. Uh, and most of these names, uh, banking names, have not come come even back to their uh, break-even points. Uh, but you should be selling stock as it's coming up. Just like uh, uh, David said, volume picks up. Volume is picking up on the downside here. Your sell rules are getting hit. You should be out of this stock, and you and you're never in this. You'll and the, and of course this will not meet your trend template criteria. Once it starts rolling over like this. All that criteria goes out the out the window, and you're not even going to be thinking about owning a stock like that. And you'd have saved yourself a, a, a lot of aggravation here. So I'm looking to time my trades uh, based on the trend template and looking for those VCP patterns. But also, I'm going to admit when I'm wrong very quickly. And and like I said, I want to I want to know I'm wrong as quickly as possible. Time is money in the market. Um, turnover. All right. Here's another thing that you hear a lot about. Turnover is bad. Uh, you know, you got to pay taxes. You don't want to, you know, take that profit. Well, you know, I mean, if you if you wait long enough, and you have losses. You won't have to worry about you know, paying taxes. I I want to pay lots of taxes. Um, I want to have lots of profits, makes lot make lots of money, and pay lots of taxes. That taxes are good. It means you're profiting. But again, you're gonna have to turn your portfolio over. Okay, you're, you're gonna I, I, the you're gonna have to do some work. <laughs> you know, it, it's not there's. Just putting into a basket of names, and by the time you see a basket of names like the Fang names or something, and you see this huge outperformance, believe me, the best is behind you. And once it convinces you that you could just salt it away and everything's going to be okay, trust me, you're you got a big problem coming down the road when you least expect it. You've got to turn over your portfolio, and that means cutting losses very quickly when 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 you're wrong and selling stocks when you have profits and nailing those profits down turnover is not taboo turnover is a good thing as long as you, you have an edge I want to talk about opportunity cost now people think that I, when I made all these big returns especially in the 90s because so many stocks went up huge you had these giant winners um, and there's a lot of these names that I bought right before they made huge, huge gains. Yahoo is a perfect example. I bought Yahoo, it doubled, I sold it. I bought it back, it doubled again, I sold it. I bought it back, it went up about 40%, I sold it. I bought it back again, it went up 30%. You know, when it was all said and done, I don't know what my compounded return on Yahoo was, but it was hundreds of percent, but it went up 8,000%, okay? Um, a lot of the trades that I, I've done, um, are swing trades. They're, they're shorter term in nature compared to the, the big moves. So if you can find one stock that goes up 75%, well, you can get the same result by find, finding three stocks that go up 20% or six stocks that go up 10% or 12 stocks that go up 5%. If you compound that out, you have to, first of all, define what your strategy is and decide what's going to be the easiest route. Can you? Is it easier to find three stocks that go up 20% or six stocks go up 10%? I think so. For me, it is. I'm better at finding those stocks than I am at finding a handful of stocks that go up 75%. So I'm usually in, in that category. This would be the more of a, of a, a short-term trading category, a very short-term sort of scalping. That's not my, uh, you know, my wheelhouse. But my wheelhouse is in that, uh, you know, 10 to 20. Uh, when I get a big winner, it might be 35, 40, 50%, and, and, and I'll, uh, I'll nail that down. Dave, I'm curious um, because, of course, you know, when I was starting as a, a, a stock trader and reading about you uh, winning the U.S. Investing Championship three years in a row, that's what got me interested in entering the U.S. Investing Championship. Um, you know, were you making those big returns because you had some giant winner, or, or and I know it's evolved over time. I know back then we we did have bigger winners, and now you're, you know we're all trading a bit more. But I'm just curious if that particular time was a result of big winners, or did you also have some of these, uh, you know, these quote unquote shorter term trades? Yeah, at that time when I was winning those championships, they were shorter term trades, but they weren't trades where I was in for two days or three days or so. I would probably usually I'd hold them for at least a, a couple of weeks or if not a, a month or two and get these 30, 40, 50% moves. And when I felt that those were getting tired or that individual stock was getting tired, then I would shift and I'd move into something else. I was constantly looking for, for the next breakout, the next big winning stocks that have all these characteristics. And so I'd be rotating my money from stock to stock. Um, so yeah, there there were a lot of shorter term trades, but it's not day trading, it's, it's more, 
weeks and then and then some months and and when I really like a company I don't want to lose a position in it and completely sell out of it I might cut the position way down and keep a token amount until it rebuilds a base and then I come back and and I buy back yeah you're gonna find again. that the, the traders that are getting the big returns consistently that's the key consistently I mean you can have you know a big year every now and then you get a bull market and you're in the right names but to consistently turn out big returns year after year you're gonna find that it comes from timing and turnover and as you're hearing David's talking about having turnover even back this is in the 80s when trading was really we didn't do short-term trading back then much it was really a cutting-edge thing to to trade in and out because commissions there were so many things against you at the at, at that point it's a, right now it's a really great time to be a trader you have just uh, uh, so many uh, uh, benefits of uh, very uh, you know tight spreads and uh, just incredible access where you can trade off of your phone and commissions are so low so you, it opens up a lot of a, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities um, you need to define your style Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and Mark, Mark, if I, Mark, if I could add that I don't think I've ever thought about taxes when I've when I'm in a stock and thinking about selling it. I've never said, you know, I, I I've got to go long term and I've got four months to go. I always base my decision on how the stock is acting, and if it should be sold, it should be sold regardless of taxes. And one last thing is that you know, so many people have. IRAs and Roth IRAs, there's no tax consequences within those. And so they don't even have to worry about uh, selling yeah, it's taxes. It's a very you know, ignominious way of thinking. When you start thinking about taxes and those type of things, you're, you're really thinking very small and you're, you're, not, you're missing the big picture. The big picture is to make big returns. And I know a lot of people don't believe they can do that. They don't, but again, you know, I, mean, I can't fly a 747 either, but I'm sure if I got the training and I went through the classes and became a pilot, Pilot, I'd be flying a 747 year, several years down the road if that's what I chose to uh, to do as my profession. So you just need to get the proper training and, and then spend the time getting the experience. But you can, you can, you can, you can beat the market every year and you can do really well and make big returns just like we're doing. It's not something that uh, we're naturally gifted with. One of the keys is to make sure that you define your style and you stick to, at least in the in the beginning, you really want to perfect something and get good at a particular style before you start drifting off of it. You don't want to have style drift. That's the first thing you want to make sure that you don't have style drift. Now, if you're a day trader, you're going to sacrifice bigger moves, but you're going to have the comfort of not holding overnight, you'll have no overnight risk, but you're probably never going to have a you know a 50 or 100 percent move like a long-term investor would. If you're a swing trader, uh, you're going to maybe sell some stocks that are up 20 or 30 percent, only to watch them go on to become 50, 100, 200 percent winners or more. So there's a price to to pay, but you have to realize there's benefits and there's there's good things and there's bad things about every approach. But you're in your particular wheelhouse. You know that's your limitation, but there's a benefit from it. So you know I find people are constantly thinking there's a better way. You know you do it this way, and then what doesn't work, they switch over to this one, and you end up being just a little bit okay at a bunch of things instead of being really great at one thing. And the reason why I've done so well, and I think David's done so well, is we've stayed with a particular style for decades. We didn't just commit to it for a year to see how it does. We believed in it, we realized it's timeless, and we've stayed with it, and we've learned everything about it. And that's that's what I would uh, recommend that you do too. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're picking my style or, you know, or some, it, that doesn't, that's irrelevant. Well, there's lots of ways to skin the cat. Uh, my, my strategy is not the only way, um, you know, uh, but, but there's many ways, but you want to stick to one of them and really learn it and become great at it. I'm going to talk about the next two keys, and that's they're basically we're going to talk about them together. Concentration and risk reward management go hand in hand, and the reason why is again you're not going to make big returns if you're wildly diversified all over the place. You're going to have to get concentrated if you want big returns and you want to consistently churn out big returns year after year. You're going to have to get your portfolio concentrated. You're going to have to get away from thinking that diversification is going to protect you and that diversification is is a good thing for your portfolio. It's not. It's not to a certain degree. To a certain degree, but diversification is just going to limit your your upside. And I'm going to show you that mathematically in just a second. But it all, it's all based on how you manage your risk reward. If you're 
you know, if your plane is upside down and you, uh, <laughs> you're you not doing very well, a, a good job at managing your risk-reward uh, ratio, well, then the more concentration you have, the more you'll lose if you have a negative, uh, you know, if you don't have an edge, you don't have a positive edge. Um, let me show you some math here. This is just taking, we have a, a little calculator that we have on uh, for my members that you can put in uh, your various parameters and then see how they would play out. Um, I, we call it result-based assumption forecast. So if I took a $100,000 portfolio and I had a position size of 10%, I use 10% position sizes, and my desired return is 40%, I have an average gain of 12% and a loss of, an average loss, that is, of 6%, with a 50-50 batting average. So half my trades are 12% winners, half my trades are 6% losers, right? I take that and I I take a look, I put it into, you know, we call it the hopper, and we look over here, it's gonna take 134 trades to get to that 40% return. Now that's doable. I, I've done uh, a few, I've done 250, I've done 500 trades in a year, uh, swing trading. So that's very doable, right? So now let's just, Let's just take and we'll up that position size to 25% now. And I'm not saying that every one of your trades should be 25%, but this is what I shoot for. When I, when I try to get built into a position and have some of my bigger positions be 15, 20, 25% of my portfolio, now that same 40% return is going to be achieved with just 54 trades. So see, you have to do far less trades. now. If we take a look here, we do 134 trades with, with that same uh, uh, concentration, that gets us 100% return now, doing the exact amount of trades as we did before. Now, of course, if you're, like I said, if you have a negative expectancy, raising your exposure is going to actually hurt you more. So you have to be a, you know, a profitable trader. But once you are a profitable trader and you're managing that risk reward, it's important that you realize that you don't want to be too diversified. So we, we covered timing, turnover, concentration, risk reward management as four key principles to, to get a uh, superior performance. Now we want to talk about drawdowns because when it's all said and done, I, I mean, I had clients, I'm not going to mention any names, but we had one client, they managed a hedge fund, um, and they, they literally were up over 1,000%. The hedge fund was up over 1,000%. A year and a half later, they were down over 99%. And the, the funny part was they sent out a letter to their investors and they said that they felt they could get it all back within 12 months, which was extremely comical. Uh, they, they eventually, of course, went out of business, um, but they were, in the, they were hugely uh, uh, leveraged and in Qualcomm and some of these names that were the big high flying and they were, they were leveraged. But um, drawdowns are really, and if, if there's anything that, if I look back at my career and my performance in the market, I'm proud of the fact that I had a lot of big years and I've gotten a lot of those triple digit years, but it would be meaningless if I gave it all back in the bear markets. What I'm really proud of is that 88% of my months have been positive and almost all my quarters, I've only had a few quarters in, in several decades, in several decades I've only had a few quarters that were even negative and they were all, they were all single digit. So this has really been the key to my success. And I'm going to go over with the with the four principles of of how I how I'm achieving that, um, Dave. You know, as far as you know, drawdowns are concerned. Um, I know you had early on, you know, you, you had where you you were up big, and then you gave it back, and that was sort of a big lesson for you. Um, any words of advice as far as drawdowns are concerned, and you know, your own story, what you learned from it, and Yeah, you should you should use. We we can we can go through this. Uh, you know, teach you all these rules, and you can read all the books that uh, that Mark's put out and Bill's put out. But a lot of this is learning from yourself. And so when you do have a drawdown and you do get hit, the market it takes money away from you. Don't get so down on yourself, but take it as a learning experience, because. What I did is when I first started out, I, I took an account and I doubled the account and then I lost it all back and, and more. I mean, I went from 30 to 60,000 and I came down into the, like the low 20s and I spent an entire weekend going through every mistake that I had made for the last year and I learned from those mistakes and I said, I'm going to get so disciplined, I'm only going to look for this exact setup 
And when I got down to that point and got that determined to only look for that setup, that's when my performance started taking off. But it all started from studying my mistakes and, and learning from what I had done, what I had Dave, done. Dave, are you ever path. buying a stock that's plummeting? Oh, no, no, I, I'm usually always buying a stock that's going up. Uh, I just, there's no reason to buy a stock that's in a downtrend or a stock that's getting hit extremely hard uh, because there's a reason why they're getting, you know, they're getting hit like that. Either the bad, new, bad news has come out, earnings have slowed down or sales have slowed or something negative is happening. I am always buying a stock that's in an uptrend that's maybe coming out of a base right, after you it's all all the direction going in your direction. So rule number one is to always trade directionally. And when I say directionally, that's the trend, the long-term trend, the intermediate-term trend, the short-term trend, and the action that's happening that day as the stock is moving. You want everything to be put all the trends in your favor. And that's, that's what I call stacking probabilities. You want to stack probabilities. When you start stacking probabilities, it becomes, it becomes multiplication, not, it's, it's not addition. It's not one plus one plus one probability equals three or four. It's a multiple of that. When you start putting all these things together, they give you a much higher probability. I'm always moving, I'm always buying in the direction of a trade. Here's an example, and I'm going to show you some examples here in just a minute. We're going to show some charts and some, so I'm going to show some recent trades too that I've just recently done. Um, so this is WR Grace. At the time, they had some asbestos issues, and they, they started to get them resolved. I, I forget, but there was you know court cases and so forth. But the stock set up really nicely. I, I remember, if I remember correctly, there was a correction in the market uh, in 04, and this came right out of a, just a perfect, perfect VCP pattern, just beautiful. And you see, I'm, I'm buying it as it turns up. And this is another thing I wanted to have Dave talk about, because back when I was just starting out and I was um, reading uh, the, the very, very beginning issues of Investor's Business Daily and I actually attended a seminar with Bill and, and David. It was like, uh, it was right in the beginning too because there was like 25 people in the room. No one even you know knew about them at the time. Um, uh, Dave said something and, on, and I didn't, never forgot it and I've been living uh, with this principle ever since. He said the best thing that I, when I, that I know I'm going to have a profit in the stock is that I'm up right away on it. The, the, you know, usually the best names and the biggest gains that I've made uh, are profitable right away. And um, you know, I, I found that when I look back, because I keep a record of all the trades that I've made and we do a lot of post analysis, we find that that's so true. That when the stock gives you a hard time from the beginning, it usually you know ends up being a poor performer. And when they're hard to buy and they just come out and and, and you you wish you bought more. Um, you know, this is a perfect example where you see just came out and it was up. Uh, I held on to this stock for quite a bit. Um, I didn't make the full 147%, but I, I, made a, I made a big move. It was close to 100% in a pretty short period of time, just a couple months. And the reason was, and this is an O'Neill rule basically, and um, I, I don't always follow this, but coming out of a bear market, if a stock shoots up 20% in a, in a very short period of time um, and the pullback is, is very sh is shallow and it recovers very well, I usually hold that longer and give it because it's shown me such strength. Um, here's a recent name. Uh, this is Shaq. Uh, I was in it for a trade, but you can see same principle. Um, uh, I'm just buying it off of here. This is what we call a cheat area. Uh, it's basically just a, a low handle, if you will. Sometimes you get uh, a few different pivots and, and handles that will form. Uh, if it's in the very lower third, we call it a low cheat. If it's in the mid third, we call it a cheat. And if it's in the upper third, we call it a handle. And that would be the, the classic uh, O'Neill Cup with handle. But um, you can see as the stock, it goes through this consolidation, as it's turning up, that's where I'm buying it. And then I'm at a profit right away. It gives me a little cushion. I'm able to go and hold into earnings and take advantage of the gap. So, uh, and then uh, I actually sold it too early. I into this gap. I think I sold some a little bit right up here and then it drifted a little bit higher there. Um, okay, let's talk about another principle of, of minimizing drawdowns. So another thing that I do that I really feel like this is one of the, the absolute most important and the, the things that have been, the, the, the principle that has been most responsible for me not having big drawdowns, and that is that I, I always expose progressively. 
And what that means is that I never just plunge into the market on my opinion. Even if things start looking really good and everything starts taking off, I'm, I'm usually just putting a toe in the water and I'm going to take a few trades and I, if, say I'm in 100% cash and we're in a correction. Um, some stocks are setting up, they start emerging. I'll usually, we're in a correction. Um, some stocks are setting up, they start emerging. I'll usually go to about 25% invested. If things are really looking good, I might go to 50. Uh, but usually my first toe in the water is 25% invested and I might buy two stocks at 10 or 12% positions or maybe four or five stocks at 5% positions, just a toe in the water. If things start working, I move it up to 50 pretty quickly and if they work from there, I try to go to 100 as fast as possible. But I'm always pyramiding on my success. Now, let me explain why this is important. Um, and this is, a, this is a key sentence, all right, that you should always remember. If you build into your exposure when you're trading well, when things are going well, and you scale back when things aren't going well, you're going to get whipped around every now and then. You will zag against the zig, if you will, but what's going to happen is when you finally get into a bull market or a bear market, you're going to be trading at your largest when you're trading your best, and you're going to be trading your smallest when you're trading your worst. So it will protect you in the bear markets, and it will make sure that you're invested heavily in the bull markets, and that's all the noise in between is 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 all is going to be there, but this is where it really all comes down to: is when you have to make the money in the bull market, and you have to keep it uh, during the bear markets. Now, very simply, let's just use um, a full position at 25 percent. We'll we'll call a full position 25 percent. So a quarter position will be 6.25 percent, right? So let's say I go in there, I risk 500 dollars, and I'm trying to you know be a two to one trader. So we'll just use you know, once you get a two to one uh, gain, you're selling it. So I take a thousand dollar profit. Well, now I can take that thousand dollars and I can bump my position size up and I can risk a thousand bucks and go to a 12 and a half percent position. Now, let's say I, I, I get another profit. I can now move that and move that and risk 2000. So maybe I lose on there. I still have a thousand dollars left over. That's in my p and That can now uh, uh, finance a, a half position. And I can go through this whole cycle and and not lose anything, okay? Now, if if things are working and I start pyramiding at some, maybe say, well, who the hell wants to break even, right? Okay, but if things are working and I keep pyramiding and things work out and I don't get stopped out of these names, now I've got myself at a big, at a nice invested position and I've really positioned myself well. But if things turn around on me, I'm out of the market. So bending, just bending with the market, bending with the market. I know, Dave, I know that, you know, you're, you're a toe in the water guy too, you know, you, you're not going to just jump in and any, um, you know, we all have our own sort of little ways we do it and rules that we do. I know, you know, you and I are both, uh, you know, more conservative than we used to be and you know, we're not putting our whole account in one name anymore. Um, any, uh, any rules for, you know, or, or guidelines for, you know, yeah, I usually, I, I determine, I, uh, now I usually go, I start with a, I have 10 stocks in my portfolio, and when I'm buying a position, a new position, uh, that's going to be 10% of my, my portfolio, I usually start at, at a 5% position. I just figure what I'm going to put into that count, and, and I start with a 5% position. And if the stock starts working out pretty quickly, then, I'm, then I move that up, up to 10%. You know, you, sometimes it might be the same day, but it, lots of times it's the following day or the third day. And so I'm I constantly just adding money to positions that are already starting to work for me. If that 5% position starts down and, and starts coming off, I'm not going to be adding any money to it until I can see it's holding and starting to go back up up through new highs. So it's it's going back to that principle of always adding to winning positions and not adding to losing positions, and and then as time goes on, if I get a, if I have a nice 10% position and that stock makes a, a nice move and it's you know I'm up 20 or 30% and it builds a whole new base, well I might even double the position at that point so because if you can get one or two great stocks in a year and you add to them on progressive basis, that's where you're going to make up for all the small losses you might take and have have great gains over a, a year period of time in your account. Yeah, and this really goes right, you know, and flies in the face of 
where I see a lot of people, they tend to revenge trade. So if they start to have losing trades, they'll they'll ramp up their exposure and try to get it back quickly and start doubling up. And that's how you blow yourself up. You've got to be humble. All right. I've been doing this now for three over three and a half decades. David's been doing it for four decades. And we still have to cut our losses and admit when we're wrong. You know, we haven't gotten so good where we're not going to have losses and you're not going to either. So you have to realize that, you know, revenge trading and trying to make it up and going in there, you, you've got to bend. And sometimes, you know, I get people like they'll, they'll send us emails and, and uh, messages on Twitter and say, you know, oh, I, you know, I, I scaled up and then everything started getting hit. Then I scaled down and everything started taking off and it's not working. Okay. But again, that's the noise in between, but that's the price. It's like an insurance policy. Okay, it, you, that's the insurance. That's the small price that you pay to keep yourself in the markets, or the good markets, and heavily invested, and out of the markets that are, are poor. Uh, just a quick note too: if you're looking at you know some of these charts and they have low prices, um, some of them might even show you know it's pennies. It's just, they're split adjusted, so they're not the actual price. Um, I'm I'm not buying you know stocks that are trading at 20 cents or even usually $10. It's usually going to be uh, you know, higher price names. Um, so the next thing that I do and, and that really helps me um, with my drawdowns is that I protect my break even point as quickly as possible. Now, there, there's there's a little bit of uh, latitude there or, or that's, a, you know, that's a relative term. Um, the key is not to choke the trade off. You want to protect your break even point as quickly as you can, but give the stock enough room to fluctuate uh, normally. And, and that's what it takes time to learn on what is a normal action and what is abnormal action. When you know what's normal, then you know what's abnormal and you know when you have to get out of the trade. So what I normally do is if the stock is, you know, it moves up from, let me see if we have a chart here. Yeah. Okay. So here's, here's an example of a, of a recent trade not too long ago. Um, in January, yeah, it started rolling over. The market went into a correction here, uh, going into February, and this stock, you know, went right in uh, as the market uh, started to top there. Uh, but I bought it coming out right here. You could see a little base coming out. Um, stock ran up, and because the market got a little uh, heavy, I actually sold a little up here, and I and I, I cushioned myself a little bit, and then it came in, and I got and I got knocked out at break even right here, and then of course the stock went a lot lower. The market corrected now. That's how it happens sometimes. Sometimes I'll, I won't even sell any as it turns up. And uh, what I normally do is if the stock goes to its first pullback and then goes into new high ground, I'll then move my stop to break even. And that'll, I usually don't move my stop to break even. I stick to my original stop until the stock goes through a first natural reaction and then gets into new high ground from there. And then the break even point becomes a, a, a critical level that I'm usually protecting. And then from there, let me see if we have another example. Okay. So here's another example of, you know, where sometimes, you know, it, it, it hoses you. <laughs> here's a perfect example. I bought this stock back here. Um, in June, uh, uh, and uh, it came out of a, a nice big base here, a nice uh, tight pivot point, came out really well, and you can see it, it had a little natural reaction, then went back into new high ground. So that's my that's my cue to move my, and you know what, I should pointer. be using my, I'm sorry, I should be using a pointer. There we go. Here we go. Sorry about that. I'm thinking the whole time you're seeing my pointer. So right here, we break out. We come through a little natural reaction here, and then we get into new high ground. So then I move my, my stop up to break even. Unfortunately, stock came back really quick, knocked me out, and then ended up taking off. Now, that happens. That, Like I said, that's the price that I have to pay. Um, sometimes it's going to happen. There's other times I move my stop to break even, keeps going. I, I, I ratchet it up. And I end up taking advantage of a big gain. It, it you know, you, again, it's all about what you do over time and what happens on average. Not any one particular trade. If you go to Monday morning quarterback and say, "Oh, well, I should never do that again," that's like saying, you know, you you had aces, and which is the best starting hand in poker, and you lost with them. So you say, "I'm never going to play aces again." Well, that wouldn't be too smart. That's the best starting hand you can have. Or you win with a pair of threes, and then you think, "I could, I should always play a pair of threes." You, you don't judge, stock trading is about probabilities. You have to think over the long term. You're going to make hundreds of trades, thousands of trades. And right? You have yeah, to Mark, be able to do something I'd, over and over. Mark, if you go back to another, that, another, one thing, uh, and I do this a lot. Let's, let's say you did buy it on the breakout and the stock pulled back and then you got sold out. 
and then it came back up and it set up again. Well, this this stock gapped, but if this stock started breaking yeah. out and it wasn't too far extended and it came through that 48 area, you can buy it back. That's where your ego, you have to throw your your ego into the trash can every time you, you step into the market because just because you lost money on it, you took a small, you would step into the market because just because you lost money on it, you took a small loss, doesn't mean that you can't buy it back again. And I've, I, sometimes I've lost money two or three times in a stock and finally I buy it again and then the thing just takes off and goes. So that's, that's where the you know, ego or uh, uh, you have to just dismiss it and, and look at every yeah, situation brand new. And that's getting into a more, advanced, uh, more advanced techniques of that. That's what we call a reset. There's a pivot reset, a pivot failure reset, a base failure reset. These are things, of course, that we'd have to spend a lot more time on. But absolutely, David is 100% correct. You know, you, you don't don't think that you know the stock has it out for me, or or that uh, you know it's it's bad. This stock's bad luck. If it sets up again, the fundamentals are there. You know, just because this stock stopped me out, it's highly unlikely that the fundamentals change that dramatically in just a few days, unless this was on some key report that had some horrible news. But it wasn't at the time. So you know, you could still have all the you know all the fundamentals are there um let me just move on here i i know i'm kind of pushing a little bit quick here now because we're running running tight on time um let's see so here's another one this usak uh it's a trucking company it real tight you know i bought it thinking you know as for a trade here um it, it had a nice it came out of the gate pretty nice for a few days came back and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll either sell some of it as it runs up quick and then move my stop to break even or what I'll do is I'll break even I'll move my stop to break even uh, on on half my position and then I'll maintain my stop on my my original stop on my other half and that's what happened this time where it came back it knocked me out of half but then it was able to move up here I got a nice gap on it it took off and I sold it into the uh, uh, into that rally and had myself a little profit on it um, finally um, let's talk about selling into strength and again this is really the hallmark of a professional is to sell you know, amateurs get all enamored when the stocks going up and they start having all kinds of uh, illusions that the things gonna keep going forever and then because a lot of times the momentum is so great they'll sell it and then it'll go higher and they'll think you know that that was a dumb, dumb thing to do but you, again you can't Monday morning quarterback you're not gonna get the high the, the chances of you getting the high even once in a blue moon are almost zero. So it's fruitless. It, you shouldn't even think of that. You're, what you're trying to do is make a decent profit. Just make a profit and make more than you're risking and do it as many times as you can that it's meaningful enough for you to be able to compound a nice big return at the end of a year. And here, you know, very simply, I'll show you a way that I, you know, played a recent trade. This is Shutterfly. We were actually talking about it today, David and I. It's now the stock is topped and looking like a short, uh, maybe. Uh, so it comes out of this power play here. Um, some people call it a flag. Um, it comes off a little cheat area. Coming out, a lot of times these little flags, I'll buy them coming out of the cheat area. So I buy it here. It runs up. And I reduce, I reduce my position, and then I move my stop to break even. So what's happening now is I'm free rolling the trade. I'm going to make money no matter what, unless it, it gaps down and gets uh, this giant gap maybe on news. Uh, uh, you know, that's the only way I could lose money on this and would have to gap quite a bit because, of course, I've already nailed down a profit. Now, as it started to go through this basing period, I was actually going to add back to it and and. Very often, what I'll do is I'll trade around my position. So I'll trade out of some, it resets. As it turns back up, I'll trade back in. So I hold part of it, I trade part of it. That's called trading around your position. But what happened was it gapped out. So instead of having the opportunity to buy it coming out, it, it got ahead of itself so quick that I actually just sold it and took the profit. Um, so this is just a very typical way that I'll play a swing trade. Um, Let's see. So this is another one recently, not too long ago, uh, GTHX, where I bought it again. Very similar. You see almost the identical type of trade where it's a, uh, a very high momentum, corrects, doesn't correct much. And as it comes through that low cheat, I start buying it. I sit through it as it consolidates. It runs up. Um, I'm up 23%. I reduce the shares. I, I sell some of my position. Now I'm up almost 40%. 
I sell a little bit more. Now I start backstopping it, and um, it was up. To, it came back in where I was only up 22%, and I decided that's it. I'm out, and the uh, stock came in from there. Um, but I just stuck to my original stop until uh, here's uh, Netflix. This is a, a recent trade in Netflix. So I bought Netflix. You can see it was putting in this base. If you'll notice, everything that I do has VCP. Okay, for those of you that understand VCP, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't, you, you should refer to my books and also to O'Neill's book about look at the couple of handles and look at what we're talking about and the characteristics that should happen while you're getting these price consolidations. You can look at charts going all the way back to the 1800s. Same thing, timeless. This is never going to change. It's simply the law of supply and demand on display. So I'm buying it here. Right, it's coming out of this coming out of this nice little tight area. We run up a bit, I reduce some. We run up some more, I sell it into this strength. So again, you see, I'm using I'm using strength. I'm almost always selling at the strength unless I'm being forced out and it's coming back in. Then I'm being forced out of the stock. But I don't want to give the stock a chance to break. I don't ever want to give the stock a chance to break. I want to get out when the getting's good because what can happen is like. You know, say I wait here and I keep waiting and backs and say, well, let me see until it starts rolling over. And then look at here, wham, it gets, you give up all this ground in such a short period of time, you would have been better off selling it on this first rally phase and not even waiting. So a lot of times if you get out when the stock's up, you'll do better than if you use a moving average or something and wait for it to roll over and to have a trailing stop. So I'm always trying to sell into strength. Dave, are you, you know, not, when you're at a profit, um, are you using strength for selling? Has that been part of your repertoire for a number of years? Yeah, yeah, it, yes, it, it, at times when the stock is, and, and the thing about this stock is it, it, if you can watch my pointer, it was going up at this angle. And then it started almost going straight up. When I, when I have a stock that's going straight up like that, I watch it very, very carefully for signs of a top. And when I see a reversal on volume, um, or here it looks like it had an inside day and gap down, I, I do look to cut down the position. I don't want to lose the position because it's usually a very, very good stock, but I will cut it back and I'll cut it back dramatically if it starts showing those time, signs of topping. But what, and what this one did, it looked like it started building a whole new base again, did not break out, but actually broke down. And that's where the, the, the rest of the position, if, if I had owned this, would have been gone. But I, I look to see those signs of when something is getting very, very excessive. And there are, there are some signs where we've had some technology stocks recently that have had those signs of excessive moves to the uh, to the upside. Yeah, and if I was in much lower, and I'm and I have a very big long term gain on it, may playing it for a big move, I might wait for it to break down a bit, and I might give it that type of room. But what I was doing here, and 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 to uh, David's point, is I started to see these Fang stocks really starting to get very popular and what I call crowded, and I was looking for some type of blow off move, and that's sort of what we got here. This is sort of a little mini, a little mini melt up. So I, I'm just going to sell right into that because I know that's going to break hard once it comes in off of that. So I'm, in the later stages of a bull market, I might be treating things a little bit differently. If I was, you know, buying this stock coming out of a base off of a bear market, I probably wouldn't be selling, you know, any of my shares here, or maybe reducing a little bit, but I'd be holding for a much bigger yeah. move. So really, it depends on where it occurs within yeah, and, the cycle. And Mark, on one, um, real one, quick, one recent example, someone asked, I saw someone, someone asked the question, do I still own Ollie? It's uh, Ollie's bargain outlet, and I still own it, and I've owned it for over two years now. But there have been times where the stock, just even recently, had a really nice run from 66 to 90. And right before earnings, I cut back on the position yep. to just to take some profits because that thing was going straight up into an earnings report. So that's an example of selling into strength when it's when it's so good and it's had such a good run. It's time to reduce the position and just take some off the table. 
Yeah, and Ollie's, you know, that's a, that's a name that David and I bought, I think, on the exact same day. We bought it coming out of that, that nice uh, IPO base, and I traded out of it, and then I got back in it and traded out of it, went back in it, and he's been holding it pretty much the whole time. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's way ahead of me right now as far as gain on the stock. But, um, but again, you know, there, you can trade it different ways. You can trade around your position. You can, uh, but, but here's the point I wanted to bring out, and Ollie's is a good example. Ollie's is a name that if you were to ask the average person about Ollie's, I doubt, you know, but a few out of a hundred would know who Ollie's is. Um, I happen to know because there's one nearby in my neighborhood that I and I and I go to it every now and then. But um, um, most of these big winners are big winners before they become household names and everybody knows them. Again, I'm going to swing back. I wanted to start with the Fang names and the and the uh, the Amazons, and I'm going to end with those because you, you really have to start to move into areas that you might feel uncomfortable with. I, smaller names, relatively smaller names, small mid-cap names, names that you haven't heard about, uh, technologies that might be uh, new technologies. That's where you want to look. When I was buying the Amgen, and even Microsoft and Dell and Cisco and Amazon. Uh, when I was buying these stocks, when before they made the really big moves, um, let me see. I know we have some charts. Here's Yahoo. You know, I'm buying this in '97. You know, nobody. I, I always make the jokes. I, I went to the institutions and I said, "You got to buy Yahoo." And they said, "Yahoo? You know, what are you talking about? That stock trades at 938 times earnings." And I'm like, "Yeah, but it's breaking out of a base, and it's this incredible technology." And you know, and everybody just laughed at me. And and then and then the stock's up 8,000 percent two years years later. So so these are the type of names that, you know, again, if you take a look at, uh, I'm just going to go past that, Amazon. Here's where I'm buying Amazon. This is my first purchase in Amazon. Amazon goes up 2,500% in just 16 months from this point here and almost 80,000% over the next two decades. Now, you want to buy Amazon now and hold it for 20 years? You, I could tell you right now, you're not getting 80,000% out of it in the next 20 years. And I doubt you're going to get 2,500% in the next 16 months. Okay, but that's when, at this point, nobody even knew Amazon, and those who did hated Amazon. Amazon was one of the most hated companies for a long, as far as I can remember. It's only in recent, very recent times that people started saying that Amazon could even make money. It was thought that Amazon would never make any money. So you want to find the next Amazon. Not, uh, and I hope everybody, uh, this has been helpful. Uh, I know we can only cover so much in an hour and 15 minutes or so, but uh, uh, hopefully this is uh, this helps you move you a little bit further along on okay. the learning curve. Thank you very much. Okay, take Thanks. care, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks for coming. Yep. Take care, Dave.